Well, we had another student that had that issue, and I don't think I could ever figure out what was going on. I was wondering why you were there. Yeah, I don't know. Last class is where I was supposed to not here, but in the middle of the so now we'll start recording. I got all the attendance done. We're in week three. Last week, what did we do last week? Y'all remember? How'd y'all remember what we did last week? They're like, we cracked Wi-Fi password. That's one of the few times that I've asked, what did we do last week? And people actually remembered what we did last week. So hopefully that was that was kind of fun. I, I did find out that uh, the network adapters that had never worked in the past, they now have drivers for in this, the 2020.2 20, 20 version of Cali. Wish I would have known that. Uh, my last class, we were able to have a sixth student in class, and I decided, well, why don't you just, here, I had a sixth disc, and I threw the disc and the card at his head, and he said it worked. Maybe just because I knocked him out, and he was, like, seeing things. No, I didn't. It, it actually worked. So I thought that was pretty neat and cool, because it was a real tech chipset on there, which should have been capable of doing all the stuff we needed, but they just never did have the, the driver tweaked for that adapter. So we broke passwords, and this week I wanted, I wanted to discuss some stuff. One of the things here under our weekly plan three, oh, and let me go back and look at plan two. What do we have in weekly plan two? don't have any Zoom meetings, I don't think, posted. But our Zoom, our Zoom for this week, or for today, I'll paste a lot under here under resources later on. Let's look at presentation topic one. We probably already talked about this a little bit. They're going to research an ID theft case and present how that person's ID was stolen, how long did it take for the victim to recover from theft, and what did they go through before their name was cleared. And that's pretty cool. Could be, you may have had identity theft done on you or a relative. Unfortunately, Yep. So that's going to be due Monday. We'll do it over Zoom. And you'll make a PowerPoint. You'll share your screen. And tell us about it. So that's our Monday class. It's you presenting or a presentation to us via Zoom. OK, so that's that topic. We want to discuss some stuff about passwords. We also have test out module two. Let's see, when is that due? That is due September 11th, so that would be Friday. The test out module two is due. It looks like somebody has already done it. I'm going to guess they're in one of the, they're, they're taking it online as the person that has done that already. Okay, that leads us to sort of our wireless hacking and talking about passwords. They'll kind of lead in. If you have a bad password or something that can be found in the dictionary, it can be broken very fast. We found that out with the Wi Fi, the Rock You, two separate words with a space, but it was still in a dictionary somewhere. And it was broke in a few seconds. Let's look at this link that is in week two. 
www.grc.com, Gibson Research Corporation. And there are other sites that are very similar to a Gibson Research Corporation. I've seen some students, I don't know if it was this class or the, my afternoon class is already looking at, at stuff kind of similar to this one. But Gibson Research, and they have a couple of things here. One, one of the big things is Shields Up. You can access a remote server and tell it to scan your firewall of your corporation to see what it sees. And that way you know what, what somebody outside can, can see after you've been configuring your firewall. Well, that's pretty cool. So they've tested over 104 million different uh, firewalls. A few of those have been uh, my request. But this Gibson research, let's look at some of the stuff about passwords. So at the top of the screen, you'll have some drop downs. If you look at services and you mouse over services, I'm trying to look how many people actually have Gibson Research up. I don't see anybody. I have somebody trying to buy computer hardware. And somebody staring at, at server manager and Ricky staring at Hyper-V. Aaron had Gibson Research. I don't know if he had it up before I started talking or not is behind the monitor on me and and he's and also the little chat window is kind of covering half your screen up here too so you're blocked on my screen and physically too so ricky go to go to grc yeah the gibson research not cat pictures goodness so if you go under services <laughs> So if you go under services here and we look under, we got a password haystacking. So we're gonna look under password haystacking. So this is a calculator. This isn't the only place that has this type of calculator on, on the web. Other people have seen how cool this was, so they built their own sites on it. But if every possible password is tried, sooner or later, yours will be found. That's true. The question is, will that be too soon or enough later? So this is just a brute force calculator that is going to tell you how long that it would take to go through every single password based upon how long your password is, how many different characters and symbols that you have in your password. And this is done without sending the passwords anything. You just start typing stuff. Stuff. So I typed in stuff. And it tells me there's five lowercase letters. There's no uppercase, no digits, no symbols. An online tax scenario, assuming that you can get a, a server to accept about a thousand uh, password tries per second. That's pretty quick going across online. It'd take about 3.4 hours to break. If you're doing a fast offline crack scenario, you've got some NVIDIA cards in your system, like four or 10 NVIDIA cards, and you're, you're running through that. And you're being able to guess uh, 100 billion guesses per second. You're looking at uh, 0.000124 seconds to break it. That's pretty darn fast. And if you're using a cracking array like supercomputer, they can guess 100 trillion guesses per second. Well, there's a whole lot of zeros before the uh, one, two, four second, second break. You can't even blink that fast. Not even with offline fast cracking scenario array. What about pass one, two, three, four? Our amazing password, if we didn't use a dictionary, 
to break it. And we just brute forced it with an NVIDIA graphics array tracking machine for like 36 minutes. Now, let's discuss that 36 minute time frame, that 37 minute time frame a little bit. That's if pass one, two, three, four was the very last password in the entire list that it had to go through and try to brute force and permutate and guess. It would take 36.99 minutes to go through every single possible combination of an eight character password with uppercase, lowercase, and digits. Does that mean the pass one, two, three, four is at the very end? And that's the last one it's going to guess? Probably not. So the likelihood that your password will probably be guessed in about 10 minutes because it'll likely hit pass one, two, three, four well before it gets all the way through the end. Somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes. We're looking at any of these calculators probably a 30% that, that you would guess the password within the third, first, you know, 30% of the entire stack that you had to go through. Some of our classes require that uh, we use all four symbols. So we've added an exclamation point to the end of pass one, two, three, four, just to greatly increase security and, and appease the engineering people that want us to make super strong passwords. With that password, I know that would probably be in a dictionary and, and crack way sooner than, than this, but it could potentially take two and a half months. I would suspect if it was ran through a brute force tool, it would likely find it in a month instead of you know, the full two and a half. I believe that's a quote out of Gone with the Wind movie. So, so this here is another thing that they start talking about. You have things called passphrases where somebody you're allowed to have a 128 character password or 127 character password with Microsoft. I believe a few may go up to 256 character passwords. I think most, most will max out like 127. Things start putting in passphrases. There is a problem with this though. That is a quote out of a movie. And you've heard of dictionary attacks, right? They now have uh, passphrase dictionaries. So this quote, where it says a brute force attack would take 1.09 all of that that's listed past the end of the life of the universe uh, to break into that. The likelihood that that phrase could be cracked via a dictionary, you might be have that broken in less than a day. So just because the brute force calculation says it would take beyond the end of the universe to crack that password using brute force capabilities doesn't mean that that common uh, quote out of a movie phrase wouldn't just be in a dictionary somewhere and found. So how the heck do you make a good password?
Well, my social could be broken in a few months. <laughs> That's not my social. So it's good to use weird stuff, but if it's a word and you replace like some of the letters with at with symbols, they permutated very similar stuff like this. Now they know S's, people will use dollar signs. They know the A will people change over to an at symbol. They know O's will be changed over to a zero. So words, they went through and, and did like a script and generated a dictionary that would take the word password and, and make a dictionary like this on it. So that is likely in the dictionary too. use that on your Wi-Fi router. Like, I know how to spell password. If I change it to symbols and some of the letters, you still be hacked pretty, pretty quickly. So there's my character password. And yeah, it's just the first letters. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn uh, with the one being an I and you know, replacing stuff like that. So you can use some acronyms that maybe help you out. But another problem is eight character passwords or they've got rainbow tables out for every possible eight character password. I think they got rainbow tables out to uh, 10 characters now. If you have a password that is 10 characters or less, it can be, the hash can be taken and fed into what's known as a rainbow table server somewhere, and it'll have your password in less than a second. That means that they've already brute forced every possible combination up to 10 characters and stored it into a rainbow table, and they've got a system with enough RAM to hold that entire database into RAM and then you can pass any hash into it and it'll do an index search look up on it in the database and instantly have your password for them. And your password preferably would be 14 characters long. So if I add some more symbols out to the end of it to pad it up, Notice the amount of time that, that escalates to, and I've got a 14 character password now, or you can back it down to 12. Microsoft is best practice would recommend that you have a 12 character password or longer because of those rainbow tables. So if you're trying to educate people how to generate good passwords. That's tough to do. And how to make a good password. So take some type of passphrase, use the first letter of each word. You know, maybe some of them, if there's like I or, or an A that it begins with, change them to a one or an at symbol. Uh, make sure there's upper and lowercase stuff in there. And then you can add, add some padding characters, which are just random symbols that you want to add to the end that make no sense whatsoever. That you just might, might break across bang at pound dollar sign, just because those are the first four symbols on the keyboard. And you can pad out passwords like that. So 1.74 thousand centuries. Isn't 
that like 1.74 million centuries? No, no, 1.47 thousand centuries. So. Yep, long time. Coolness. So this whole page talks a lot of neat stuff. Which one is harder to crack? That one, because it's a little bit longer and it takes 95 times longer to search with the brute force than that one. But that's just a brute force thing issue. This one looks more secure and it might be more secure, but that one just because of the length of it it has uppercase it has numbers it has lowercase and it has symbols and it's the one longer it would theoretically take 95 times longer so whole really good article on passwords now if you need to get a password and you're going to set up a uh, VPN connection from central headquarters or remote site somewhere. Or if you're setting up uh, a password to authenticate a machine device, like an access point to, a, to an access point controller server somewhere for those two to communicate with each other. Then you're trying to figure out how do I come up with a really good password. And GRC and some other tools on the internet have some password generators. So if I look under services here and I come down to perfect passwords and I click on perfect passwords, it will generate a 64 character password. Do you remember studying IP version six? You know how many different addresses you can create with IP version six? I think they say there's enough for a thousand addresses per square meter of the entire surface of the planet. I think the correct answer to that is just all of them. All of them, yes. It's insane amount of them. This is a 64 random character password. It's actually 512 bits long. So it's it's like four times the size of a IP version six length or whatever on that. So we have a 64 and 63, and these here are considered perfectly random generated passwords. And it is so astronomically infeasible that when it generates this random password that it has ever generated that password for anybody else in the history of this website. And the password that I like is the 63 random principal ASCII characters or that it includes symbols, uppercase, lowercase, numbers. It includes all four. And these others just, re you know, letters. But if you do have some type of system that can't handle symbols, they generate a couple, uh, two separate passwords here, 164 and 163 in length that you could use. So what I do when I'm setting up uh, VPN gateways between systems, I'll go to this site, have it generate me a perfect password that's this long. And the thing of it is, is I'm gonna have to store that in a file somewhere. I mean, I'm not going to type that or remember it. I'm gonna have to have that stored into an encrypted drive that only very few people know how to get into it. Here on campus, they 
have these passwords stored in a in a uh, secured folder on the server, and then that folder is encrypted. So I've got to go, and then I think the file is even has the password on it. So there's about three different steps they have to get to to get to the password. And that's for in times when, say, the the move, the firmware lightning strike you know, took out the device, and you have to replace the device with a new one. And you could go in and copy the password out and put it put it into the config of the new device out there. So I'm going to copy this one with the 63 printable ones. And I'm going to go back to under services and password haystacks and just see how good that password is. And then I'll hit enter to get it to read. So there's 17 uppercase, 14 lowercase, eight digits, 24 symbols. I'm sure your numbers will be a little bit different than mine if you copied and pasted it. Are your numbers different? So yes, yeah, so each password is randomly generated with a different combination. Check out how long that it says a brute force tool would take to crack that password. They ran out of words for the number that's that big, so they just added hundred millions and a bunch of trillions out there and then century at the end. Which is all of that times a hundred. So you're asking now uh, like the, the access point and stuff. That's what that I would use. If I didn't want my neighbor stealing my my Wi-Fi, I'd go here and put a password in like that. Now friends come over, hey, can I use your password? Your, uh, what's your password for your Wi-Fi? Like, <laughs> um, I'd have to have that in like a OneDrive folder or saved in a note on my uh, my phone where I could copy it and text it to them, and then they would have to copy and put it into theirs. You just hope that your friend won't forward that text message to everybody like, hey, I got the password. But it would stop your neighbors. They, we, we would not have been able to break that if I set that up as our password. We'd have to use some other type of attack. Brute forcing would have been impossible in that, that route. But it is possible. I'm sure you can go to GRC on your phone, go to perfect passwords, and you can copy one of these password fields out and set up your home Wi-Fi with that. Just don't lose it. Copy and paste it. And you would not use this password to as a login, like the administrative login. You wouldn't be able to remember that. But you could remember that you could get to that you know, for your device. To have connection. If you're creating a password to protect your certificate that's you know signed by third party somewhere that's protecting your website, your certificate being the little lockbox at the top, you're wanting to protect your private key, you would use something like this. Because that's something you'd rarely have to go to. You go, you go set it once, and you configure it on your server so it can decrypt it and load it in the RAM. And that's only configured once. So, any discussions? What do y'all think? thinking about changing a few passwords, that might be a good good thing to do. Now, like I said, your laptop password, you wouldn't use something like that for laptop password to get into it. But setting up the, like I said, VPN, you want that connection to be secure and you don't want anybody to be able to, to break that encryption stream. So you throw that in as a key 
for being able to authenticate into that stream or your Wi-Fi. Um, you know the routers, the Wi-Fi routers that have the WPS button? You click a little button and it puts into the pairing mode and you click a button on your device and they pair and they auto generate a password. They do something like this. The password's generated about like that right there. That's what WPS, so that's a pretty secure connection. And then people can only get to your Wi-Fi if they're able to physically hit that WPS button and put it into a pairing mode so the two devices can negotiate a really secure string. Does anybody use WPS? Or do you just set up, or just do set, set a little simple password like password so you can easily tell, you know, type it in to make devices connect? I use WPS all the time, but that's mostly because I'm lazy. Laziness and more secure is good too. That's a plus. Yep. So we've seen the, the hacker side where you can throw stuff through brute force. And now we look at it from the IT security side on how to create good passwords. Let's see what else we got here on the GRC site. And that we want to cover. Hmm. This site's got a lot of other cool stuff on it. One of the cool things, let's see, you know what? Uh, Let's not move off of that just quite yet. Let's stay on the, the password thing and have have y'all checked to see if your account have you checked to see if your account's been phoned? Have you been cloned? Have I been cloned.com? There's a website on that. So if you've not, you can go to this website and they collect the public disclose. You know, when, when companies get hacked, they have to publicly disclose what accounts were compromised. And this company has collected all of those public disclosures and they have everybody's account information that um, some company has said has been attacked. So you can type your email address in here and check to see if your email address. And yes, I'm doing it. I feel safe that they're not going to sell my information. I've not had any, any downfall doing this in the past, but you do want to make sure that you're going to uh, this site and not some others that, that may want to collect your junk. So I'll type in my email address and it says, oh no, there's uh, eight, bre eight breaches listed on here. So Adobe Corporation, and yes, I have an Adobe account because that's how I get my Adobe software through the university and install all the cool software stuff. And their company has been broke and my email address was included into that.
And apparently the passwords were exposed. So interesting. Apollo. I don't know what the heck Apollo is all about. I don't remember having an account with them. So Apollo is out there telling everybody where I work at. Of course, that's kind of public knowledge too, but still. This B2B uh, hack right here is probably why I get some of my spam mail. Where people, I get emails about, you know, stuff that be related to university. Because they know that I work at a university because in the database somewhere so they can target me. On LinkedIn. And the LinkedIn passwords were were cracked for a lot of people. This brings us right back into dictionary attacks. If your site shows up and it mentions anything about uh, the passwords were run through brute force and the hashes were were transferred over they figured out what password you're using with your account and if you use the same password with all your accounts it's in the database somewhere so i see a couple of people with green on their screen that means there's not any publicly disclosed <coughs> hacks of whatever email address that you put in it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed not to have been been hacked somewhere, but your email's not been in a public disclosure yet. And there's all the breaches. My face. Yeah. I think we got a new one. Yep. That's about the time it died. It was 2008. Yeah. It died quick that that year. I like my face. No Facebook. I liked it too, but it just went away. And these other kids are like, MySpace, what's that? So because of all these data breaches and people scanning these passwords, uh, let's look here. National Password Day, how to make your account safer, blah, blah. So you should also change your password if you use one of the most popular passwords of 2020, according to Splash Data. And that's because they, you know, have been hacking all those other accounts. 
One, two, three, four, five, six. We're all the way out to nine. QWERTY, password. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So most of them are just numbers across the number screen. And I love you. Other common passwords include nothing, secret, password one, admin. What do y'all think about those passwords? You know anybody that uses those passwords? Works at FedEx. A technology specialist uses one of those most common passwords. Oh, no, no, I thought he did. What? Oh. He used to. Okay, he used to. Now he, I don't, I'm not sure the name of it, but he used to. Generates those passwords, and so the one okay. So there's a list of the top 25 passwords over the years from 2011 through 2019 on the Wikipedia site. Dragon, Princess, Football, Welcome, Solo, Monkey. All the letters on the top of the keyboard. Pretty, yep, yep. A bunch of symbols across the top of the keyboard. <laughs> I found Jesus. Oh. A bunch of zeros. Yep. We use let me in, right? Or is that a new password? I think we turned it through a zero. Oh, you think that's probably. Oh, yeah, all right. Football and football. Yep. Football, baseball. There's a cap of football somewhere in here, probably. But. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think it's I think it's popular this year too. So eight years in a row. One, two, three, four, five, six is the most popular password. There's a lot trying to make you use different different stuff on that. Yep. So these make up more than 10% of the passwords that they have found, the top 25, 10% of the population. <laughs> so that means somebody in this classroom probably is using one of these passwords as a password somewhere. Although we are supposed to be taking IT classes and hopefully we're a little bit more aware of security. But statistically, somebody in this class, either online or sitting in this classroom, has one of those as a possible password. <laughs> so I'm like, close. <laughs> uh, if it's close, it's probably not a good thing. I did use one of those. Uh, 
Yeah, any type of sports. Paul says he doesn't think uh, this year would be a, a year of football would make a comeback. That's a password. <laughs> Definitely not Razorbacks pound one. Don't know that big a password because nobody had ever guessed that you would pick that as a password. These are backs number one. What? No. And okay, we want to take a little bit of break. And there's another aspect of passwords and stuff I want to talk about and how we can do password security. And that will be after break. We're actually utilizing some of that here on campus. We'll take a break and at 11, we will talk more about passwords. Zoom recording. So everybody's here. And we know, we all know that Paul is the devil because he doesn't like peanut butter. Don't want to be affiliated with Paul anymore. Okay, so let's let's go back to passwords and something to make passwords more secure is adding in a second authentication factor. Two factor authentication. You know, I've heard of that, right? Two factor authentication. So how many people have to log in to a place and wait for a text message to come in on their phone to log in to a site? I think everybody in here has to do that because everybody has a remote PC account. And it was set up where that y'all have to use two-factor authentication. Yeah, dot gov accounts and stuff. Um, no, not like Duo. So two-factor authentication with SMS texting has been popular for a while. It is now starting to be not popular anymore. And the reason for that, uh, the hackers have been able to spoof phone numbers and stuff. Have you ever had somebody call you and, and ask you why that you, were, that you were calling them and you didn't make any phone calls that day? It's because spam callers used your phone number to make some phone calls. So yeah, I've, I've gotten people call me up and go, I just returned in your phone call. I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure that my number spoofed because I haven't made any phone calls with, you know, for about a week because I have no friends. And my family's disowned me, so I've, I've definitely not made any phone calls to you. Um, but it was uh, spoofing. Spoofing is very, very common. I know that uh, we talked to, had a faculty meeting a year or two ago, and everybody was complaining about that, that fact. They can also spoof your number. So if they've authenticated and figure out you have two factor authentication, if they can guess your password, they can run a script and take control of your, your phone number, the phone companies temporarily. When that two-factor authentication text code goes across, it'll send it to them instead of your phone, and then they can get into your system. So that's been proven that that can be done. And they have now marked SMS texting as, as too vulnerable to implement. So guess what my bank did over the summer? They just implemented it. Brand new cool stuff. Well, they, they revamped the side that they did have. They did have text messaging before that. So I, I don't know what all that they added, but I think they just added a new new system and kept it up, kept up the SMS. But that is now considered not cool. Well, guess what? Here at the university, which is normally way behind everybody, but we have a really great chief information officer. He's keeping everything on track. He did read about SMS texting not being a good thing. They had implemented 
a search committee for increasing security and two-factor authentication to research and different type of things like using smart cards or retina scans and um, blood draws to check your DNA and stuff like that. Okay, maybe not quite that vicious uh, if you have to give a prick of blood every time you log into a computer. But they researched all the stuff, the SMS, um, Office 365, was originally I was getting SMS text messages to be able to authenticate. But because that's no longer something that you should deploy as, as a method to secure down authentication, they moved over to Duo. So Duo is a, is a two-factor authentication method where you have to have an app to generate a code. When you log into the email, it'll pop up and say enter code. You launch a Duo app on your phone. It gives you a six digit number. You type the six digit number in. So that's app generated. And those are secure VPNs. And that is now considered a method to where that hackers won't be able to spoof that and steal your code like they can with text messaging because SMS is SMS was built, you know, back in the 90s whenever text messaging was started and it was designed for no security, just go to phone number to phone number to think about security implementa implementations of, of that back then. If you're, if you're old and have no friends and your family hates you and you're broke, you have an iPhone 5 still and Duo won't install on it. So you get these little key fobs, like this little key fob, start video, a little key fob like that. Everybody see? And it's got a LED screen on it. So when it asks for a password, I can't use my phone. I have to click a little power button on this thing. It gives me a six digit code and I punch it in. I did have an issue with this key fob. It got out of sync. It gives you a 30 second window. And if the key fob gets out of sync, it's timer chip on it then all the code you put in will be invalid and you're stuck and you can't log into your system even though you know your password so you have to call keith and go dude you're the duo admin and give him the there's a serial number on the back and actually i think you just click the number and give him three numbers and you toss the three numbers in and then it resyncs itself so run into that, but Duo is considered to be more secure. I do know that E-Trade, they're a financial firm. They were doing this back in the mid 2000s. They were sending out these key fobs with RSA, the exact same thing Duo. So it's not something new, but I know that E-Trade, they were, a, they had some smart IT personnel that knew not to implement SMS. When SMS, come out in two factors like oh that's cool that's really secure and then I learned otherwise after a, a year or two that reading articles saying that no that's not not the best method so does that mean that you should not use and password and two-factor authentication if, if SMS is the only only authentication method for two-factor that the site has now you should definitely implement two-factor authentication because it does throw another layer of security and protection into your account where you have to you know know a password and you have to receive a, a second code on an out-of-band device that that is still still more secure than only having a password but if you have sites that can use code generator facebook app has a code generator in it so if you're using uh, the Google Duo or the Facebook code generator or any of the other type of apps and they integrate with your bank or some other type of login mechanism, that's considered more safe than implementing the SMS texting.
A two-factor authentication brings next layer of security. Um, common method is SMS text messaging. The problem is SMS is not secure. And they can intercept fish and spoof SMS. And that right there is why that the university went to Duo instead of SMS. Do you use SMS for two-factor authentication? Question mark, don't. Well, like I said, if that's if that's the only thing that's available, like it's a bank, they don't offer anything else, go ahead and set up two-factor authentication with SMS because it's more secure than only using your password. But you might talk to your bank and go, look, I'm in college and I'm kind of smart and you should probably implement an app-based authentication than SMS because here's why. And then they'll tell you like, we got too many old people who are too stupid to do anything. We have to implement the text messaging. Maybe the answer you get, I don't know what answer you'd get, but that's a possibility of that. <clears throat> there are several articles on why the two-factor authentication with SMS is not it says it's not secure. It's not as secure. There's, there's better out there. But if at all possible, use two-factor authentication. So Paul said he requested one of the uh, dongles and you never received it. Uh-oh. Alex is interning in IT, I think. Why did Paul never receive his dongle? I thought he did, so I can ask. <laughs> because you don't like peanut butter is the answer from the back of the room. Okay, so has anybody used any other type of authentication in the system other than username password with a two-factor authentication method like SMS or, a, or something like Duo? Has anybody ran into a system or worked somewhere where it used something different? The, uh, the end user is uh, like a uh, 3D Okay, so security picture that uh, when you're authenticating, you have to pick a picture to add it into your account. Yeah. So it displays, is this, does it display the picture after you put your password in? Yeah, it's displayed on the front showing you. Mm -hmm. so while you're checking it out, check if you know the number. Like 20 on the front, if you pick one, and you want to remember that picture, and add it in if you do your username and password. Okay, I've seen similar item. Um, I think my bank several years ago did that, but when you chose a picture, after you typed your email or your username in, it popped the picture up on the screen. And if it didn't pop the right picture, you're supposed to stop and go away. So I'm not sure how that really secured stuff down, but I could see where that if you put your username and password in and it popped up 20 pictures and you had to click the picture, that that would be, that would be kind of cool. And we have a magnetic, uh, key card, face ID, your uh, thumbprint. Mythbusters showed where that they lifted somebody's thumbprint and put it on a ballistic gel finger and used it to, to get past. They found a lot of door locks and stuff in the systems. They just made a black and white copy on a piece of paper and put the piece of paper over the sensor and it read it and let them in. So it was actually just absolutely atrocious on security. Uh, 
So the magnetic, magnetic key card or a, or a card that's got a smart card chip in it. So I've seen a lot of people have smart cards. They slide a the little smart card. Everybody's got credit cards now with a little magnetic um, little metal chip in there. Everything on there is encrypted. Your, your account number is encrypted. So it's ascended encrypted all the way to the, the credit card bureau. That way if it's intercepted anywhere from the from that machine to the credit card bureau, it's encrypted and they can't see what the number is. Only the credit card bureau can decrypt the machine and verify the information. And then they send a token back that they got the information and charged it. And that's how they're protecting. The magnetic strip is clear text when you swipe it. And that's why at the gas stations they get skimmed so easily because they'll scan the, the magnetic strip. Um, I use cash cards, especially at the gas stations here in BB because I've got my bank account empty three times. So after the third time, I'm like, I'm done with that. And I've not had my bank account emptied out since I went to cash cards at the gas station, especially the Sitco down here going towards Cersei, the four way down there. That one was, there's they, they is, I think, permanently have a credit card skimmer and all those bumps. Uh, but that's what your, that code is, they also have those smart cards. You, you slide in, then you put in a pin number. So you got to have this card and you got to know something, which is a pin number. That's two factor to get into computer systems. Um, I don't know that I've seen that. I think everybody's trying to move off of those smart cards and move over to like Duo, where you have a, your nap on your phone, gives you the number to log in. Apparently, people lose those cards or forget them, but they don't forget their phone. You ever heard of somebody forgetting their phone at the house? <laughs> okay, older people, parents, maybe. My dad can't be that terribly old, though. Yeah, he's not that terribly old. So some people can forget their phone. They're not technical nerds. Or even non-technical nerds, they, they're addicted to the phone now. It's an addiction, so that's why they try to go to the app on the phone. Most people are not going to get separated from the phone. They have withdrawal symptoms, seriously. Crazy. I don't leave my phone anywhere. I might forget my name badge. I might forget my keys to come and open up the door to get in my office. <laughs> For some reason, I'm not gonna forget my, uh, may forget my glasses so I can read the computer screen. Um, I'm not gonna forget the phone though. And I did not forget my glasses today. It's just harder to see all of them on. I can see the computer screen better, but it's hard to look out there. I've seen more strange. Uh, so what else do we have for password? Well, in the land one, land two course, we learned about Kerberos, right? Did you learn about how does Kerberos work? Anybody? Anybody know how Kerberos works? So a big problem with networking is continuously sending your username and password across the line. Your authentication credentials. That can be sniffed and then cracked. So what they do with Windows Active Directory, Kerberos is a ticketing system. I'm pretty sure it's covered and test out or that I covered it. Maybe not. Maybe I just covered it in security class. I thought I covered it in several classes. Just to try to get y'all to remember what Kerberos is. Kind of like a ticketing system. You, you, um, the best explanation is maybe like, like going to see a movie. You can order your tickets online 
and get your ticket printed out. When you go to the ticket booth and you have the like simple face high school kids working behind there, you don't have to give them your credit card information and they won't have the opportunity to steal your credit card information. You have the ticket already because you did that pre and you can hand them the ticket and you get into the movie or the concert or whatever you're doing. So that protects your credit card information at that route. Well, that's what Kerberos does. You authenticate the one time against Active Directory and you get Kerberos tickets from then on. It's kind of like the concert ticket says, hey, and it's good for five minutes. Each ticket's good for five minutes. You got like multiple tickets, you got a you got a main ticket that you can use that will grant you something called a resource ticket. So if you want to print, you get this other ticket that says you can use this printer for the next five minutes. So you grab that ticket and then you present it to the printer and do your work on it. You're no longer presenting your username and password. It's a big long encrypted key that's time-based that the printer can look at and go, okay, this is token. I don't know who this person is, but it says they're allowed to use this printer. So it lets that person print. And that prevents your username and password from being sent to that device. The device is, uh, you know, told basically, you don't need to know who's accessing you. You've got one leader who's gonna tell you, it's gonna give out these tokens that, that lets you know if the person's allowed or not. So for your, after you've logged into Active Directory, the rest of the time, you're only using these tickets that are generated every time that you want to access something. And then, like I said, they're only good for five minutes. So if somebody steals that ticket and tries to decrypt it, it should take hundreds of trillions of years to break that encryption on that ticket. And that ticket will be expired in five minutes. So pretty secure. Did Microsoft create this? Do you think Microsoft created something that amazing secure? No, you are very correctly. They did not make that in Massachusetts Institute of Te Technology. Smart people up there in their doctorate program created Kerberos. So it's MIT. I think the university even has a patent on it. I believe, but it's allowed for other people to put it in their products. I don't know if they have, does Microsoft have to pay MIT money for it or not? But cool stuff. What else do you know about passwords? It's a kind of open discussion, even you online. Anything else that you can think of on password stuff? Facial recognition, Paul posted that. I think some of the iPhones have a facial recognition feature, don't they? Some of the ones that are later than my iPhone 5. <laughs> but I think that I've heard that some people can just hold up a photo of the other person and it unlocks the phone. So I don't think that's very secure. What do you think? I say facial recognition. Mythbusters already showed that fingerprints can be lifted and, and spoofed really easily. Just lift them off a doorknob and transfer them over to something. Um, so it's got to be Two-factor authentication is going to pretty much have to be something you know and something you have or, or something that's sent to you via out of band, such as a duo. So the most secure that's it's held up over the years 
is a token, a smart card. You have to have that, and then you have to know a PIN code for it. That's two-factor authentication. That's held up. Biometrics, facial recognition, uh, retina scans and stuff, that stuff is not held up because they've been able to show pictures or lift, lift fingerprints. SMS hasn't been able to, to hold up. The apps are, have not been hacked yet that I've been aware of. So Duo and a password has held up. And that our little Duo thing is, they've been using that for at least 15 to 20 years. I mean, not Duo itself, because Google created that, that lately, but these RSA tokens that has been implemented for probably at least 20 years and it's still held up for security. Okay, what do we want to do for the rest of the day? For those people that are online, if you're not very far from the university, we're having a back to BB bash thing today. We probably started at 11. So because of our cool university stuff, and I believe we've had enough open discussion on on passwords for today, I think we should just probably cut out uh, about 20 minutes early. And that way we can go over and avoid the crowd and avoid the coronavirus threat from checking out Back to BB Bash. And maybe if there's food over there, we can get food before they've given all the food away. I don't know that there's food. So we told there was food. Uh, I think that's probably what we're going to do. We're just going to go ahead and close this out. I'll upload this. So if you want to, you know, watch anything, we didn't create any VMs. It was mostly a discussion. Day. We did some little labs on GRC. You can play with the GRC website. Look at other stuff that's there. He's got lots of stuff. That's pretty cool. And have you been phoned? So let's go ahead and end this. Anybody online have questions for uh, in the, the meeting? <laughs> All right, well, I'm hearing no, so I guess that we will We'll cut loose and we'll go check out what's for free over back to BB Bash.